Welcome everybody to Age of Empires 4. And if you are new to the channel because you were interested in Age of Empires 4, welcome. There are going to be plenty of AoE 4 videos headed your way. And I thought that, okay, so Age of Empires 4, it's going to be launching with eight civilizations. And if you are familiar with Age of Empires 2, which I will be mostly speaking in the context of because that is what I mostly play and make content for, but Relative to all of that, AoE 4 civs are a lot more complicated and asymmetrical compared to AoE 2. So even though the game is going to be very fresh as I'm recording these, and there really aren't going to be a, a ton of strategies and metagames that have developed at this point, I still thought it would be helpful to do a rundown video for each of the civilizations and just do a quick intro to what their tech trees are, what their unique units do, because I'm going to be starting with the English here, and... Uh, a lot of the descriptions uh, aren't very helpful in game, so I want to do what I can to show you guys what they what everything means. Because uh, I have been playing this game for a little while now. I have been part of the Cardinal Council, which was essentially a bunch of Age community members who were uh, helping test the game and give feedback and stuff like that for several years now. So I do have some experience. I'm no, I'm no pro or anything like that. So let's just go through all of these civs and see what exactly we have in store. So first for our quick little intros is going to be the English, like I said, and they are considered an easy difficulty civilization, and that is no surprise. They are the default campaign, which you can also find on my YouTube channel, by the way, with the Normans. Um, and they're kind of just like the default civilization of the game, and the most approachable if you're an AoE 2 player, or really just anybody coming from a different RTS in general. So the game characterizes them as lasting from 850 to 1555 CE, I did a little bit of research, and I can't figure out as to why these particular dates would be considered like pivotal turning points in English history, so uh, if you know, let me know in the comments, because it vexes me as somebody who uh, loves to study history. But regardless, they are classified as a defense, longbow, and economy-focused civilization, and that is, I would say, pretty accurate. There are some of these descriptions right here which I find a little strange, because uh, they're kind of less clear ways of these specific civ bonuses, which I'm going to go through all of, I'm going to talk about their influence, their unique units, or unique unit in this case, as well as quickly jump through their tech tree and uh, all of their unique techs, at least uh, try and go for all that stuff. So starting off here, we have their main eco bonus, construct farms for 50% less wood. Farms near mills gather 15% faster, which uh, also is their influence system, which I will get to in a little bit. So essentially in AoE 4, farms uh, cost 75 wood by default, and with the English, they will be costing um, 37 wood instead of uh, 75. So that's going to be some really nice wood savings. And if you're familiar with the full work in AoE 2, uh, this is kind of how it works. And if you build farms near a mill, your villagers will gather from them 15% faster. Now, I'll put up on the screen right now what exactly that looks like when it comes to the in-game user interface. But I think it's pretty clear as to how exactly you should be orienting your farms. Uh, Farms and mills are all two by two buildings, so you plop a mill in the middle, and then you can perfectly place eight farms around it for maximum efficiency. Next, we have Vanguard Men at Arms available in the Dark Age. Now, this might be confusing for AoE 2 players because Men at Arms is like, you know, the Feudal Age Swordsman unit. In AoE 4, the Men at Arms is just the name for the entire Swordsman line, and with most civilizations, it only is available beginning in the Castle Age. Now, with the English, they're available in the Dark Age, and before you freak out, their stats are appropriate to the age, right? So the Vanguard Men-at-Arms are weaker than the early Men-at-Arms, which are weaker than the Castle Age Men-at-Arms. Also notably, in AoE 4, the Swordsman line is a lot stronger than it is in AoE 2, even after some recent buffs, but they have a lot of armor. And uh, yeah, these guys can be really deadly, and the English having access to even just this type of unit from the very beginning of the game gives them some flexibility in terms of how they can attack and how they can defend which is pretty nice. And like I said, every other Civ has to wait until Castle Age for these guys, except for the Holy Roman Empire, which I will get to in another video, uh, but they can only make them in the Feudal Age, so English even one-up them. So the next bonus is Stronger Villagers Who Wield Short Bows. Yeah, this is what I was talking about when it came to uh, unhelpful descriptions. What the heck does this mean? So once again, I'll put up on your screen uh, what exactly the stat differences are between generic villagers and English villagers, uh, but you should be able to see that English villagers actually deal slightly less damage than generic villagers with five instead of six, but you do notably have that five range as well as a faster attack rate, 
which in practical terms means that, uh, yeah, enemy scout cavalry better watch out because these, you know, archers, they can uh, pack a bit of a punch. You can uh, snipe your scout cavalry as it runs by in Dark Age. If you're attacking with anything that isn't super armored, English villagers are going to be able to fend them off much more easily. And this is, as we will see, uh, part of what classifies them as a strong defensive civilization. In short, it's easier to keep your villagers alive because they can fight back better. Next, we have Town Centers, Outposts, Towers, and Keeps provide the Network of Castles bonus, giving 25% attack speed to all affected units. Uh, once again, I'll show you guys a picture on screen of what that exactly looks like. It's a, a big old circle with a little campfire thingy uh, indicating what exactly the building is that's granting the bonus, and it's kind of straightforward. All the units that are in that area are going to be attacking 25% faster, which is pretty darn strong, especially with archers being able to just hold down a position, whether it be, okay, I'm trying to defend an enemy attack, or I'm trying to push an enemy with like a forward keep. In this game, uh, keeps are castles, by the way, guys. Again, it might be confusing to AoE2 players, uh, but just that nice little defensive boost is really, really handy, especially for archers, like I said. Next, town centers fire twice as many arrows. That's one that's nice and straightforward. So in AoE4, town centers will fire arrows even without any villagers garrisoned inside them. Uh, which does make early raids that much more difficult to pull off in general. But of course, the English one up that even further, firing double as many arrows, so you do have to be really careful, otherwise your units will be nuked by enemy town centers. Though villagers, by the way, still do add extra arrows when garrisoned in the town center. It's just, you know, you they fire like one arrow by default, and then, you know, each villager will add more arrows uh, after that. And last, we have uh, every save in the game has, like, one very specific naval bonus. And for the English, they have military ships have plus one range. Pretty straightforward. Okay, your ships are able to attack from one tile away. So you get the first shot in when it comes to naval fights with your galleys and your hulks. I will say that in AoE4, ships are really, really clunky and almost impossible to micro. But still, getting that first attack is quite helpful. And also, sneak peek. In AoE4, the Karak is the equivalent of the AoE2 Cannon Galleon, and normally they have the same range as enemy keeps. This is just an interaction I, I found already. Um, so you normally need the, uh, where is it? Uh, Chaser Cannons tech, which gives, it does the same thing as the English bonus, right? It gives your warships plus one range. Uh, normally you need that to outrange enemy defenses, whereas the English, they can get that without having to spend the... 300 food and 700 gold uh, on that upgrade. So that is, uh, you know, an interaction I've already noticed, which is pretty cool. So in AoE4, every civilization has an influence mechanic, which pretty much is, okay, you get some sort of bonus based on how you build your buildings in relation to one another. Uh, and for the English, it is their uh, farms work faster when placed near a mill, which I already talked about. Moving on to the unique unit, so every Civ in AoE 4 has at least one unique unit. Most Civs, in fact, I think all other Civs have more than one unique unit. But uh, yeah, English, that nice and basic civ uh, civilization only have the Longbowmen. But it is, of course, an all-time classic for AoE 2 fans. Uh, and I think, yeah, they're in AoE 3 as well, so lots of Longbowmen for Englishy sorts of civilizations. And also, unlike AoE 2, uh, you don't build your unique units at keeps. Uh, you build, or, or castles, you know, you build them at whatever the logical production building would be. So in this case, you build them at the archery range, where they replace the regular archer. Now, if you're thinking, Ornlu, what the heck is the difference between a longbowman and a regular archer? Because uh, it doesn't really show you in-game. Don't worry, I got you covered, fam. So compared to the generic archer unit, the longbowman, as you can see on your screen will have one more attack and one more bonus damage against light melee infantry, which is pretty nice. Uh, light infantry units are things like spearmen, so they are dealing more damage, but they do move a little bit slower, uh, and of course have that extra range with the, uh, you know, seven range as opposed to five, so they are longbowmen, they fire from long range, and they are also a bit more expensive as they cost uh, 10 more food, so they cost 40 food, 50 wood, instead of 30 food, 50 wood for the regular archer. Also worth mentioning is in AoE 4, archers work different than they do in AoE 2. In AoE 4, archers are trash units, like the regular archers are, are trash units. And by that, I don't mean the units are bad. I mean that they don't cost gold. And instead of being your sort of general purpose unit, they, as they say, they're better against unarmored targets. So the less armor an enemy unit has, the better the longbowmen are. And which units have armor and which don't is a little bit confusing, but just know that Against the light armored targets, you want to use archers, and against the heavier armored targets, you want to be using crossbowmen. 
which you can also get alongside archers. Again, it might be confusing for AoE 2 players, but crossbowmen, um, they do extra bonus damage to ar uh, armored targets, and they are also not a trash unit, and they cost, you know, 80 food and 40 gold here. So there is that important distinction. So now I'm going to run through their tech tree really quickly. Uh, in AoE 4, there's a lot going on with the tech trees, and, the, you know, there are a bunch of different uh, unique techs for civilizations. I'll do my best to cover all of them, and, you know, feel free to yell at me in the comments if I miss any. Uh, but also, uh, I'm going to be going over the landmarks for each civilization, uh, which I should briefly explain. So, in AoE 4, you age up not by clicking a button, but by building a landmark with most civilizations. And again, most civilizations have the choice between two per age. And you, these are physical buildings that you, you know, create with villagers. And each provide a different specific bonus and have a different characterization, um, you know, based on what those bonuses do. So, uh, I'll go through those as well. So starting with the first English unique tech, uh, we have Enclosures here, which is an Imperial Age tech that kind of works like Burgundian Vineyards uh, in AoE 2. So your farmers will generate gold, uh, you know, very slowly, but, you know, they'll generate a nice little trickle of gold over the course of a long game, which is going to compound with your faster working farmers and your cheaper farms. So lots and lots of farms for English. At the barracks, we already have the uh, Vanguard men-at-arms and even early men-at-arms that I talked about earlier, but you also have this unique tech, Armor Clad, which increases the ranged and melee armor of men-at-arms by plus two, so you get plus two, plus two armor for your swordsmen. So these are some chonky, chonky swordsmen, and uh, yeah, they are going to actually be very resistant to arrow fire. So if you think that you're going to counter our, uh, infantry with archers, it's a lot tougher in AoE 4, but also these guys are fairly expensive, 100 food and 20 gold a pop. Moving on to the dock right now, uh, the English actually have Shipwright from AoE 2, reduces the cost of ships by minus 10%, so similar effect to AoE 2, but in AoE 4 that is actually just a unique tech for the English civilization. Also notably, uh, they get galleys, they get hulks, and they get demo ships and caracks. Not every civ has every single warship, but the English, you know, they do have them, so good on them. Okay, so these are going to be your Feudal Age landmarks. You must pick between one of these two to advance to the Feudal Age. First, we have the Council Hall, which is a military landmark, and that produces longbowmen at plus 100% speed and also contains their relevant upgrades. So this is a really, really uh, <laughs> strong uh, landmark to, when it comes to going for longbow rushes, which I imagine uh, most of you will be playing a lot of and like, against quite a lot of on the ladder, especially in early days, because it... Uh, it can wreck you if you're not ready, and you can just churn out longbowmen super quickly, and also gets their upgrades, which I'll get to in just a minute. Then the other option is the Abbey of Kings, which is a religious landmark, and it heals all nearby friendly units that are out of combat by plus four every 1.5 seconds. So you can heal up relatively quickly if, you know, you're not in combat. I would imagine you'd want to go for this if you have a more defensive approach, and you don't want to go for those uh, longbowmen right away. Maybe if you're playing on a closed map, like, say, Black Forest or a water map, uh, then I can imagine you wanting to go for this guy instead. Uh, nothing unique about the English here, but because this is the first of my little Civ overviews, I do want to point out that town centers in AoE 4 can be built from the Feudal Age as opposed to the Castle Age of AoE 2 and AoE 3, um, but you ha can build them for 400 wood and 300 stone. So yeah, just letting you guys know. All right, at the archery range, uh, English, they don't have regular archers, they have longbowmen, as you know. You have your crossbowmen, and you have hand cannon -y. Er. <laughs> I don't know, that looks funny to me. But again, these guys are not unique to the English. What are unique to the English, you have Setup Camp, which Longbowmen gain the ability to set up camp, which leads them to heal plus one health for every one second, so you can heal up a little bit. And then you also have Arrow Volley, which is an activated ability that increases Longbowmen attack speed by plus 70%. So essentially, you click a button and your Longbowmen attack a lot faster. Also, that reminds me, I completely forgot to mention Palings. So yeah, Palings, uh, it's already an active ability for the Longbowmen. And what it will do is it creates a bunch of sharp spikes around the uh, the longbowmen, like wooden stakes, and they will do 25 damage to cavalry and stun them for point or 2.5 seconds. So it makes the longbowmen not like good against cavalry; they'll still get wrecked. But at least you know cavalry have to think twice before you know running down the longbowmen. So it makes them again a little bit more versatile than your generic archer. Totally should have mentioned that earlier. Anyway, moving along now to the Castle Age landmarks for English, you have the King's Palace and the White Tower, which I, I guess they left in Gondor or something. Anyway, these are really straightforward. The King's Palace is just a town center. It's literally a town center. And the White Tower is just a keep. Like, it is exactly a keep. So, 
as English, you can get these guys. Either you want to improve your economy, or you can improve your uh, defenses, or just go for like an offensive uh, white tower to pressure your enemy. Uh, notably, again, you can build TCs in age two, but you cannot build castles until age three. So getting the white tower means you can get a keep before anyone else. Also keeps, uh, it says they cost 800 stone here. I thought I remember them costing 700 stone. Regardless, you can get keeps fast. Then you have the unique tech uh, Network of Citadels, which essentially just increases the attack speed bonus all the way up to plus 50%, which is pretty crazy. You get that at the keep. At the Siege Workshop, the English have a unique tech called Shattering Projectiles in the Imperial Age, which uh, causes their trebuchet projectiles to shatter on impact. Wow, who would have thought? Increases their area of effect. Now, personally, I haven't had a ton of experience using trebuchets against units, um, but I guess this makes them a little bit better. Uh, they're really, really slow and expensive, but you can get them in the Castle Age, just uh, FYI. Then we move on to our Imperial Age landmarks, the Berkshire Palace and the Wingard Palace. So the Berkshire Palace, it's also kind of like a keep. In fact, it is exactly a keep, but it's stronger, and it has plus 50% greater weapon range and double the number of arrow slits, so it's like a super keep. And, you know, you, you plop this down in some sort of central area or choke point, and uh, yeah, you're going to be set when it comes to defending. Then you have the Wingard Palace, which produces the Wingard army, which you can see here it costs 100 food, 100 wood, and 200 gold, and trains one each of longbowmen, spearmen, men-at-arms, knights, and trebuchets. So you get like a mixed army at a discount. Like you, you build it in a, a batch and you get a discount. So yes, you can get units cheaply, but chances are you don't want like all of the units at once, and you're not going to have upgrades for all of them at once. And lastly, their wonder, every sub has their own unique wonder, and the English one is the uh, Cathedral of St. Thomas. So that is the English civilization in a nutshell for you guys. You can see that they are indeed a very straightforward civilization. You have your easy farms, you defend with your villagers early on in your town centers, you get your longbowmen going, you have the network of castles to protect yourself, and then you slowly creep across the map with uh, your defenses, your longbowmen, and then maybe some trebuchets and men-at-arms to mix things up. This is definitely the save I would just recommend for people who are just getting their uh, toes wet in AoE4 because, like I said, they are pretty straightforward and things can get really crazy with some of the other civs. So that's kind of what English are all about. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please be sure to leave a like and, uh, of course, subscribe to the channel for more content. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.